So how do we know if our forecasts are any good? Well, one of the things we got to do is to find ways to measure the accuracy of our forecasts. And so you have the actual values and we have the predicted values. And an important measure is the error in the forecast. We start off with that. So if we take the actual minus the forecast, we have an error. And we could generate a number of um, measures using that data. For, for one, we could calculate what we call a mean absolute error or mean absolute deviation where we would take the actual minus the forecast, right? So in other words, we don't care if it's a negative difference or positive difference. If we've under forecasted or over forecasted, we just simply know the magnitude of the error, hence the absolute value. The danger with just adding up the errors is that the negative ones cancels out the positive ones, and you might get be mistaken about how good your forecasting model is. But if you under forecast it by 10 units and you over forecast it by 10 units, your average error is 10 units. Uh, but if we added those two, the negative 10 would have canceled out the positive 10. And all of a sudden you say, oh, my, er my error is uh, zero. Well, that's no good. The mean squared error is kind of almost like a, a, a variance. So if we were to take the forecast errors and we squared them, divide by n, so in other words, it would be like actual minus forecast squared sum of all of that over n. It kind of looks like a standard, devi uh, sure standard deviation, but a, a variance. And we could use that to calculate the standard deviation of the, of the forecast errors and use it in calculating a confidence interval for errors. We could uh, certainly do that. Basically applying some of the things that you learned in statistics. The mean absolute percent error is one of my is, my, is actually my favorite um, measure because it, it basically takes the absolute um, deviations and expresses it in the form of a percentage. What we do first of all is to take the actual deviation and express it as a fraction of the actual. So say we had a case where um, the actual demand was um, 100, the forecasted demand was 80, so the error is 20 units. Since the actual was 120 divided by 100 means that we were off by 20%. So that to me is more tangible. And so if you did that for all of the forecasts and average those percentages, you get a mean absolute percent error. And so if your if your if your MAP is 5%, that means on average you're 5% off. If it's 10%, on average you're 10% off. And to me, that's extremely tangible. I like that. Um, we talked about exponential smoothing before, but now what if there's trend in the model? If you simply use a basic exponential smoothing model, you will lag the trend. It's not good enough. And so therefore, what we have to do is to adjust the model somewhat. So this model is called exponential smoothing with trend fit. Right? Forecast including trend. So the way in which you do this is looks very similar to the exponential smoothing model, but it has a second component to it. Is that if we were to generate an exponentially smooth forecast, first of all, and then an exponentially smooth trend, we could combine the two to give us a forecast including trend. So what does that look like? Here's the exponentially smooth forecast, and you can see it looks similar to our initial formula, which is the a fraction of the actual plus the one minus that fraction of the forecast including trend now we have it as ft minus one plus t minus one but if you really look at the definition of the f of uh, fit it's ft plus t tt which is basically the uh, smooth forecast plus the um, trend component so this ft minus 1 plus t t minus 1 is really ft minus 1 so what we're doing is we're taking a fraction of the actual plus the remaining fraction of the forecast we blend in those two and then that gives us our smooth component and tt if we take the previous trend estimate and we take a fraction of that and then we look at the difference between our two forecasts right here and take a fraction of that 
then we now have a smoothed trend component. Now for the likes of me, I'm not sure why we would try to take this off of the forecast as opposed to the actuals. To me, I would have taken the actual in T minus 1 and T minus 2, something like that. And then, um, and then calculate a fraction of that. In other words, use the actuals to kind of est um, estimate or smooth the trend. But the model basically was designed with these two forecasts in mind. And we simply follow that model. We have a demonstration, which uh, I will leave for you to follow in the text. But the model does perform a lot better than if we simply had used a this this sort of standard exponential moving model so if we look at this now we see a lot better performance for the f uh, for the fit model forecast including trend compared to if we had just done a straight up basic exponential moving model right trend projections this should bring you back to statistics which is essentially a linear relationship between two variables. In this case, because we're talking about time series data, the relationship is between time, and so x here actually represents uh, the independent variable, which is time, and the predicted variable, whatever that is. Okay, So fitting a, a sort of a trend model, if we put our data in Excel and we plot the two, the, 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 we plot the graph. Excel could fit a trend line for us quite easily. But here, all you need to do is to apply what you've learned in statistics before, which is the least squares method. And the least squares method will allow us to find the line that has the least error um, in terms of its estimates. So when you use it for predictions and you calculate the forecast errors, the line actually minimizes the... Uh, mean squared error MSE for the data and hence we call it the least squares method the formulas here you may be familiar to you that you used in statistics which is that you find the slope of the line and the intercept and we then simply get that trend line Excel could generate that for you quite easily and I'll demonstrate that later on in class so here's a case of a, of a forecasting model where we could predict demand from this formula. And remember, in our case here, x would be time, period 1, period 2, period 3, period 4, period 5, and so forth. Okay. How do we handle seasonality? Now, the textbook describes a process, but I do believe that there's a, actually a, a better way, another way to do it. Anyway, let's just sort of go through how the text handles uh, seasonality. Um, first thing that we got to do is um, we look at uh, we collect some historical data. And our historical data may be across multiple years. Uh, so for example, if we're looking at quarterly, uh, if our seasonal patterns happen to be quarterly, like um, the, the, the seasons like fall, winter, spring, summer, then we could have multiple years of data so maybe three, five years, ten years, I don't know, however many. But we certainly can use that data to then compute what we call seasonal factors. Okay. So here's how we do it. Find the average historical demand for each season. So if I have four years of data, and I'm looking at fall, winter, spring, summer, I will take each of those seasons, so all the springs, the four springs and the four winters and the four summers and the, and so forth, and, um, and average them. And then that will give me an average demand for each season. All right? Then I will take all the overall demand and compute the average for across all the seasons and all the years. Now, if I divide the average seasonal um, season demand by the average for all of the years, I will then get a seasonal index for each one of them. So, technically, what the, one of the ways to think about a seasonal index is that there is an average demand, this sort of level demand, but it's adjusted 
for a season by the seasonal factor. So if the, if the seasonal factor is 1.5, then what we're saying is that in that season, the demand is 1.5 times the average. If it is 0.6, then it's 60% of, of the overall average. All right? So that's kind of the, the, the basic concept behind that. So now you estimate the next year's total demand. And since you already have next year's total demand, you then divide um, to determine, um, you sorry, you would take that, um, you would take that total demand, figure out what the average seasonal demand is, and then multiply it by the relative by the seasonal index. So divide the estimate of the total demand by the number of seasons. So in this case, four. If we're looking at the quarterly, and then multiply it by the corresponding seasonal index. And that should give it to us, right? So let's see if I could sort of give you a sense of this. So what they've done here, for example, is to take, this is monthly data. So we're going to actually handle each month uh, independently as opposed to aggregating the data into, say, quarters and so forth. So across the three years, 2007 to 2009, we've averaged those three years to give us 90 average those three years to give us 80. So now we have the average monthly demands, right? Then we could take the overall average of all of those, and that overall average is 94. We could do it by simply averaging the averages or taking the average of all of these numbers right here. So we have 94. If we now divide each of those by the 94, we now will get a seasonal index, all right? And uh, so now, for example, for January, the seasonal relative or the seasonal index is 0.957. What does that mean? That simply means now that if we now have our new monthly average demand, we will adjust it by 95.7%. In other words, we, we bring it down a little bit. Uh, that's what will happen in a case like that. All right. So here are the values that we computed which basically means that the next uh, time, we, all we have to do is to predict the average of monthly demand for the next year, 2010, for example, and then multiply each of that value by each of those seasonal factors to estimate what the demand will be for that period. So the next one, we will take the, va um, the next average and multiply by 0.851 for February, 0.904, for March, 1.064 for April, and so forth. And that's pretty much uh, what that is. So if, for example, the forecast for 2010 was 1,200 units, then we divide 1,200 units by 12, which is 100, right? And then we multiply the 100 by 0.957 for January, by 0.851 for February. So that's where we get the 96 and the 85 and so forth. So that would basically be a 100 times this, 100 times 0.85, and so forth. That's one way to do it. And so we see for the forecast for 2010 in purple, looks fairly similar, but um, slightly adjusted because you have a new average demand. All right? Associated forecasting. Well, in, um, in trend forecasting, our independent variable is time. The, the, the x-axis is time. In associative forecasting, we're saying that there are two variables that are associated with each other, and we, if we forecast one, then we do the prediction for the other. So for example, interest rates and housing stats. If we are able to predict interest rates, then we could predict housing stats from a formula because we believe there's an associative relationship between the interest rates and the number of housing stats. All right? So use when changes in one or more independent variables can be used to predict the changes in the dependent variable. Most common technique is linear regression. So again, we're applying linear regression. Only difference between that and trend is that trend uses time series data. So on the x-axis, we tend to have um, time, like period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so forth. All right? And so as you could see, we have the same basic model. Y hat is equal to A plus BX. 
B is the slope, X is the independent variable, right? A is the um, intercept on the Y axis. We're just simply looking at an example with um, sales versus payroll. And you get your linear equation, and there we go. Right, we could do our predictions. So once we we get um, we do some sort of estimate of payroll, then we're able to estimate what sales we would get. Now, just as you did in regression, you could get the standard error of the estimate, and what's the value of getting the standard error of the estimate? Um, in statistics, you would have seen it as SE or SYX in some cases, and you could see it is basically the difference between the actual and the prediction. If we square those and then divide by N minus 2, then we get the standard error of the estimate. That is useful in calculating confidence intervals much in the same way that you did for statistics, confidence intervals for predictions. All right? And so it's a useful measure to have if you want to not just have a point estimate of your forecast, but rather a confidence interval of the forecast. Correlation. Correlation is useful because it's important that uh, before we go about trying to establish a multiple regression, linear regression, or a linear relationship between two variables, we just check for the correlation between the, the two variables and if we get a fairly strong correlation coefficient then we, it makes sense to actually go ahead with the, predictor, with the prediction equation um, through linear regression. All right? So this is just a reminder of, of what you've already done in statistics that the correlation coefficient is SSXY over the square root of SSX times SSY <coughs> which is SS x, y is the sum of the squares associated with x and y, and then s s x, sum of squares associated with x, sum of squares associated with y. So you've done this before. And a lot of things, we don't have to do this by hand anymore. We certainly can do this in Excel very easily. We see here negative correlation, positive correlation, but it's not one. We see positive correlation as perfect because every point falls on the line, and this is just so random that the correlation, linear correlation, is pretty much zero. Okay, As you know, the closer we are to the extreme ends of the range, negative one, positive one, the stronger the correlation. In some cases, we have multiple independent variables, and so therefore, we use multiple regression analysis, and where our, pre our predicted variable is a function of a couple of different independent variables. So, housing stats might be um, dependent on interest rates, the consumer price index, population, these are all potential independent variables that we could use to compute them. And we, we typically don't do this by hand, again we just use software to assist us in developing the equations. How do we monitor forecast? So you have a forecasting system that you're implementing but you need to make sure that that forecasting system um, does not start to veer off and give you fairly bad predictions. So what do you do? You make sure that you monitor the forecast. And we do that with what we call a tracking signal. And that tracking signal is really the cumulative error to date. You look at the cumulative error, and you want that cumulative error to stay within some computed limits. So as long as you stay within the computed limits, then you could say your forecasting model is functioning okay. And um, there are formulas for actually calculating that. So here's uh, where we get our tracking signal, the cumulative error divided by the mean absolute deviation. And what is a cumulative error? It's just simply you take the errors and then you add them up. So if you have now added up n errors, right, for over n periods, say 10 periods and so forth, then in this case you would calculate the absolute mad that's the mean absolute deviation for the 10 periods and then you express the cumulative error over that particular mad value and we call that a tracking signal 
and when we have some limits that we establish control limits in terms of a certain number of I think it's 2.5 MADs MADs and so on and once we are within the range then we're okay but once the tracking signal falls outside of the range it tells you that there's something wrong this is an outlier and there's something wrong with your forecasting model kind of similar to is uh, you know hypothesis testing when we use confidence intervals well with confidence intervals when you have values that fall outside of the range of confidence intervals then we know that um, we have an outlier in the data okay I'm going to skip this um, I want to talk briefly about adaptive forecasting what happens is that uh, because forecasting is not an exact science uh, whenever you make a forecast and you assess its accuracy if you're not happy with the accuracy and you feel that over time that the performance is deteriorating you could adapt the model in other words you don't have to stick with that model make some changes so it's possible to use a computer to continually monitor forecast error and adjust the values of alpha and beta so if there are coefficients in your model then you adjust them so that you could improve the accuracy of your forecast I you just have to be adapting them all the time given the um, given the uh, state of the um, the errors in your forecast all right so it's called adaptive smoothing or adaptive uh, forecasting last but not this is this concept called focus forecasting developed by American Hardware Supply and um, based on two basic principles one sophisticated forecasting models are not always better um, there's just some simple rules of thumb sometimes that you could use and then there's no single technique that will dominate all the time so if if that's the case then what you could do as a simple process is this test a number of um, different uh, models on the historical data and whichever one gives you the the, um, the least error you use that one to forecast and then you continue in the next period you I think what you might want to do as well in terms of uh, deciding which model is giving you the, the least error is that you might throw out as you get a new uh, piece of data uh, you, you may throw out the last one and then run the model again new piece of data throw out the last one run the model again and then making sure that you select the technique that gives you the least error each time that's one thing some other people would just actually take a forecast from a couple of different models and average them or weight them in some fashion there's really no hard and fast rule because forecasting is not an exact science it's just an educated guess and you're free to do just about anything you want as long as you feel you have some rationale for it okay so that's forecasting and we'll stop right here in the service sector forecasting is um, could be a bit more of a challenge because you don't have these tangible products and it's difficult to track uh, the same way you could track sales and demand it, but you can't really do that in, in the service sector so you need um, you need uh, to be able to find something tangible so you might be able to forecast for example uh, the demand for for a product in, uh, in at different time intervals of the day so if you look at again now Tim Horton's example what, what you know at n between 9 and 10 was the demand for service between 10 and 11 was the demand for service and so on so you may find some way to capture demand over particular time periods all right so some of the unusual challenges we have special need for short-term records the needs differ greatly as a function of the industry and product holidays and under calendar events um, can again pose some challenges because what happens is they spike your, your demands and unusual events and so forth okay, so here you go in terms of forecasting for example in a restaurant fast food restaurant percentage of sales that come from different times of the day that's one type of a forecast that is generated a call center so FedEx could actually try to figure out um, during the, the hours of the day where do most of, when when do most of the calls actually arrive, and you can see somewhere typically between 
10 and 6 p.m. It, it tails out towards midnight and it's very low before 8 o'clock. All right? Like, so you could, you could certainly apply the um, some forecasting techniques to the service environment. So forecasting, just to finalize this, um, is a very important practice in operations. We require a forecast for planning purposes, and so therefore it's very important that we find ourselves using some measure of sophistication as we attempt to plan, since the operation system is so vital in driving costs, competitiveness, productivity, and so forth. So having a good forecasting system is an imperative for excellence in operations.